click to accept the recording. You should have gotten the, the request now, okay? And uh, well, we, with this, uh, uh, yes, we just start. So welcome. Uh, today we have a, a very special topic. We are going to hear about one of the hot topics results from, from the year, from Lepton Flavor Universality at LHCB. And this has been really one of the most commented results of the winter uh, and spring uh, conferences. So it's uh, it's an exciting topic. But we are uh, lucky enough to have uh, Paula Alvarez Cartelle, who is uh, the convener of the Rare Decay group in LHCB uh, currently. So, so she is really one of the, the top experts in, in, in this topic. So thank you so much, pa pa Paula, for uh, for agreeing to give the talk. And, and as I told you before, uh, we are sorry that you cannot uh, you cannot be in Madrid, uh, which would have been nicer. This year is what it has. has. So as a brief introduction to Paula, she did her PhD in Santiago on penguin-dominated decays uh, viscerous uh, in and she finished in 2014. She continued her work in LCB as a postdoc. Focusing already on, on lepton free universality and lepton free violation in a, in a number of, uh, of different studies. She has also worked on, on dark matter searches using deuteron production in LCB. So this is uh, it's actually quite, quite interesting. That, that's also something that I would like to, to hear her uh, tell us more about. And that was already as a, in, the, in the Imperial College in London. She was also a Sun Fellow last year in 2020, and uh, she's currently a lecturer in the University of Cambridge. As I said before, she's the convener of the Rare Decays group in LHCB, so, so she is uh, really one of the, the best persons to tell us about uh, this topic. So thank you so much uh, for, for, for the uh, accepting, and uh, with this I hand over to you and, and you can, I'll switch off my camera and you can, you can start the seminar. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh... Uh, well, thanks a lot for the super kind introduction and for the invitation to give this seminar. And it's a pleasure for me to talk to you a little bit about this analysis. And indeed, it's a, it's a pity that we cannot be all together in a room, but hopefully that will change soon enough. Okay, so uh, today I will I would like to give you a, a bit of an introduction on um, this lepton flavor universality um, uh, result, but. Uh, to do that, I want to give a kind of a, a brief introduction. And obviously, as every high energy physics talks, uh, it needs to start with a picture of the standard model, uh, which is, uh, you know, the our the solid pillar uh, and has been so for the last decades and uh, has explained all phenomena, all phenomena that we can observe. But although uh, we know that it has to be incomplete as you know, some things cannot be explained just with standard model. So just as a, um, a way to somehow solve these problems, uh, we think of the standard model as um, a, a low energy limit for a more fundamental theory that might live a, a higher scale. Um, and, you know, at the LAC, uh, you and me try to look for this so-called neophysics. Uh, in different ways and today I'm going to talk about uh, some results that kind of use the indirect approach to look for this high energy um, new physics uh, by looking instead of at producing these new particles directly in the detector uh, rather to look at how these new particles might contribute virtually to some processes that are already there in the standard model or might be forbidden in the standard model and look at precision measurements of those uh, to kind of uh, comparing with the standard model prediction, um, be able to see some signatures of this uh, um, sort of high mass uh, degree of freedom. Right, so for these kind of indirect uh, searches, there is a, a very good candidate uh, uh, to use, which is uh, the, the so-called flavor change in the current. So this decays uh, such as, for example, a transition of a big quark into an S quark and a couple of leptons. These are forbidden at three level in the standard model. So they have to be loop mediated with all that super, the suppression that comes along with that. Uh, and so that means that these, these kind of processes are small in the standard model, but that is not necessarily true in, in, a, in physics beyond the standard model. So, it essentially means that any new physics 
effect will be relatively large in these kind of processes. So this is what I will talk about today. Um, and in recent years, we have been uh, seeing some hints of deviations from what the standard model tell us that the different mm, properties of these decays uh, should be. Um, and you know, this involves a series of different kinds of observables that I will try to, to give you an overview of. Uh, and, and, but we have also been observing uh, some tensions also in actually the case of B quarks that are, um, that are possible at three level in the standard model. Uh, and we, uh, we have seen some hints of lepton flavor universality violation also in B2C and new transitions. Um, I won't touch upon this uh, today, but I will try to make a little bit of a link uh, towards the very end of the talk. So the problem that comes associated with this kind of uh, indirect searches in general, and particularly with, this, uh, uh, with the measurements that I'm going to talk about today, is the fact that obviously we are looking at you know, we are interested in the in the fundamental process of a big quark decaying into an S quark and a couple of leptons, but we never really observe that. Rather, we look at the case of mesons into mesons and, and some leptons, and that essentially complicates a lot the predictions from the from the standard model because you need to take into account QCD uh, that you know allows you to bound these these mesons and essentially makes. Um, life more complicated by including by by you having to include in your calculations very non perturbative terms that are difficult to compute. So I mean, it is important to choose what observables you want to look at uh, in order to minimize somehow the effect of these kind of uncertainties in the predictions, so that actually you maximize your sensitivity uh, to new physics um, uh, and to discovery. Right, so just a, a little bit of a summary of these tensions that I was talking about at the beginning. So the first of them appear in the measurement, in the direct measurements of the rates of uh, different decays mediated by these B2S uh, LL transitions, in particular in those uh, having muons in the final state. So here you have some uh, plots the, for different of those uh, decays. So you have at the top left uh, B2, uh, I don't know if I can point, yeah, I can. So here you have uh, B plus decay plus mu mu, B0 to K star mu mu. Uh, here is lambda B to lambda mu mu, and down here BS to phi mu mu. All of those uh, proceed through a B to S mu mu transition. Uh, and for most of them, not all though, but for, you know, most in, in most of the cases, what we observe is that the rates that we measure uh, are tend to be lower than the standard model prediction. In particular, in, the, in particular, in this kind of low Q square region, Q square is just the invariant mass of the two leptons. So just below these kind of empty regions that appear, because there you have a resonant contribution from the J psi M psi to S. Uh, we we tend to see these these rates uh, below the standard model prediction. Now the tensions there are between two and three sigma, but as I was saying before, you can see from the predictions here, the huge error bands in the predictions that these numbers are actually quite affected by these uh, theory uncertainties. Uh, now, the good thing is that you also, I mean, the inconvenience uh, having, you know, to deal with, with methods, uh, it can also be thought as uh, a way of also maximizing the number of observables that you get access to, uh, and in particular, when you have a vector in the final state, then you can perform angular analysis with a lot of different observables that are sensitive to different kinds of new physics. Um, and in particular, it, in particular, it uh, allows you to define some observables uh, as ratio of you know, different asymmetries uh, in, in the angular distribution that can actually be shown to have less of a dependence with this theory uncertainties. Um, this is what we call in the jargon optimized observables, and one probably that is the most famous of those is uh, P5 prime, which is just, as I said, an asymmetry in the angular distribution of uh, B0 decay into K star and two muons. Uh, and this, guy, this plot kind of became famous because we have been seeing also a tension in this, in this asymmetry. Again, in the lower queer square region uh, with respect to the standard model prediction, which uh, was just updated uh, last year uh, 
or two years ago, I don't know, I lost one year with this pandemic thing, uh, two years ago, uh, and, you know, the, the tension remains there. So this is at the level of around three sigma. And just recently, we also put out a new measurement uh, of the kind of I just been rotated uh, B plus to K star plus uh, mu mu, uh, where, you know, here the, the that's is obviously much lower, so we cannot really give a definite answer, but at least, uh, uh, you know, we will be able to say something about this uh, with this case in the future. So um, the, the issue with the, with the theory uncertainties, uh, it comes from the fact that uh, there is, you know, debate on, you know, once these, these kind of tensions were shown, uh, for the first time, then everyone kind of went and reviewed a little bit what these predictions uh, contained. And there is some debate uh, to whether actually the, the predictions are or not missing a part, uh, you know, some, some ingredient uh, in particular uh, to do with this kind of non perturbative contributions, where you would have a CC bar loop here uh, that can then modify. Uh, the form factors as a function of q squared uh, and give you some tensions, for example, in the rates and also uh, in the angular distributions that we were looking at. So an example here on the right comes from, from this paper here from some theory friends where they actually, what they do is they allow for some of these uh, so-called non-local contributions uh, uh, to float uh, in the feed to the data. And as you can see, this you know, if we don't make any assumption on what is the size of these contributions from theory, then you could presumably accommodate these kind of tensions within the theory. So the debate is there. So what, what are we seeing? Is it just uh, miscalculated QCD or are we actually seeing uh, an infinite X? So this is the, the point at which lepton flavor universality comes into, into place. Uh, and this is because this is a way to reduce to a negligible level the impact of these hadronic uncertainties. So as you know, in the standard model, uh, the couplings of the gauge boosons to the different families of leptons uh, uh, is equal. Uh, and this is what we call lepton flavor universality. Uh, so when we construct ratios uh, like this one that is shown here, which is a ratio of branching fractions of uh, a B decaying into, well, you know, a B hadron decaying into a S hadron, so a K and a K star, whatever, and a couple of muons over a couple of electrons, then all the hadronic information is the same in both cases, um, and it cancels in the ratio. So, you know, in the standard model, this number is one with a very, very good precision. Uh, so, yeah, the, the QCD uncertainty falls uh, to the level of 10 to the minus four. So this, you know, uh, no longer, you know, a discrepancy here could no longer be explained by this. Uh, and then there has been some uh, recent studies on the what are the QD corrections for this, especially when you actually deal with experimental measurements in where you are cutting the phase space in, in different sections. So, you know, the impact of this could be at, at the level of 1%. Still, this number is very, very well predicted. And that means that any sign for a discrepancy uh, with the standard model value of one, uh, then really is a smoking gun for new physics. So that's what we did. And we uh, started doing the measurements of these LFU, so-called LFU ratios uh, in many different, uh, well, in a bunch of different decays involving these V2SLL transitions. So here just show the status uh, as it was uh, before March this year, uh, where you have uh, here at the top RK, so for B2K LL transitions uh, at the top right RK star, uh, where you actually can measure a couple of different bins just because you have here a pole uh, at Q square equals zero. Uh, and this is due to be updated quite soon. And we also made a measurement of uh, uh, this kind of LFU ratios in, in baryon decays, uh, so with lambda V to PK uh, LL transitions. And as you can see uh, from these plots here, so the, here obviously the, the, the precision is driven by, by the LACB point, um, which uh, has the best uncertainty. And what we see is that uh, they are all consistent to be below the prediction of one. Uh, everywhere. Well, I mean, for the RPK, it's still compatible at one sigma, but the tensions for RK star and RK were at the level of uh, between 2 and 2.5. 
So the way that we actually study, so what does this tell us about new physics? The way that we study this is actually trying to combine all of these uh, different observables into uh, a single fit or a single uh, you know, piece of information. And we do that uh, by using an effective theory. So this is essentially just this trick where we can describe a specific interaction in terms of an effective Hamiltonian that is formulated as a function of uh, perturbative uh, short distance uh, couplings, effective couplings, uh, which are called uh, the Wilson coefficients, uh, and some local operators that uh, include the long distance and Lorentz structure of the interaction, uh, and that the, those are the non-perturbative contributions. So essentially, when we are looking at B2SLA transitions, we will be proving some certain um, Wilson coefficients, in this case, for, for this kind of transitions, C9 and C10 in the standard model are the, the, the main ones. Uh, and some local operators. So by doing this, if you, when you do the fit to all of these observations in this framework, uh, you would be seeing in physics either by seeing a deviation from the standard model prediction uh, in these uh, Wilson coefficients or by seeing just new Wilson coefficients that are not there in the standard model. So this is exactly what we do. Um, and when we put all of these B2 SLL uh, observables into a single fit, uh, what we actually see is that the preferred fit is away from the standard model and the significance of this is quite large nowadays. Um, and it seems that what would be required to explain, you know, this kind of observations better is an inclusion of a new vector uh, coupling uh, and potentially also a, a new axial vector coupling. So this would be a shift from C9 only or C9 and C10. Uh, but I think it's also good to, to see what the different constraints um, from the different observables tell you. Uh, and in this, uh, you know, at this point in time, uh, so this was presented actually before the new measurement of RK, just this year, uh, you can see that there is maybe some tension between what the, the kind of so-called clean observables, so like left and flavor universality and also VS2 mu, which, which is also quite clean, tell you about this global fit and the constraints coming from all of the angular observables and branching ratios. So, uh, you know, if in both cases we are displaced from the standard model point, but we might be in some tension here. So it is really critical to improve the precision in the, in the clean observables where we are sure that we have the, the theory and certain under control uh, to understand what uh, this picture is telling us. Right, so I so that is what we tried to do by, by doing this measurement. So just wanted to give you a little bit of, of a flavor of, of what points of the detector we use the most. Obviously, you, you will know about this, but anyway. So at least this measurement is made in, in the LHCV detector, which is running at the LHC, is the experiment out of the big four that is focused on the study of heavy flavor. And this is what drives the, the, the kind of layout of the detector in that forward direction. Uh, and for, for us, obviously, the, the points that are more critical are the vertex locator here at the interaction point that allows us to see the displacement of the B uh, meson decay uh, vertex from the primary interaction, and that allows us to reduce drastically the background, as well as the Cherenkov uh, particle identification detectors. And obviously, the tracking stations uh, and magnet allow us for a good measurement of the momentum and the mass that we will use in the final discrimination of the signal. And then for this analysis, it's quite critical the calorimeter because we are dealing with electrons. I will explain a little bit more about that. And obviously, the muon uh, stations that allow us to identify the muons with quite uh, large purity. Right, so the measurement I'm set to talk uh, about today uh, is uh, the measurement of RK. Uh, so RK is defined as the ratio of branching fractions of B2K mu mu uh, to B2K EE, integrated over a certain range in Q squared, which is the mass of the dimion pair, of the dielectron pair. Uh, and the, the update of this, of this uh, result actually follows very closely what was done in the past. So we, we do this measurement between 1.1 and 6 GV squared and Q squared. 
uh, and we essentially update the 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 result with the with the full data set from from uh, LHCV. So in the past we were using around five investment of our coming from investment of our coming from one, uh, 2015 and 16. In this iteration, we almost doubled the data set by including 2017 and 2018. Right. So as I was saying, so the calorimeters are important because we are dealing with electrons and they actually constitute the main uh, challenge of the analysis. So the fact that we are you know, trying to calculate this ratio between rates to electrons and to muons means that we need to control the differences between muons and electrons quite well. Uh, and those are two particles that behave very differently uh, within LHCV. Uh, this is because the electrons are much um, uh, softer, so much uh, lighter, so they emit a lot of external radiation. And so that affects uh, hugely the, the momentum resolution and the environment mass resolution, and it affects actually other steps of the reconstruction. So in order to mitigate a little bit this, uh, this fact, uh, what we, have, we do have a you know, an algorithm in place that tries to uh, recover part of that strand radiation that the electrons lose when traveling through the detector. Uh, and this is a little bit of a, a sketch explaining what happens. So, you know, when your electrons radiate uh, before the, the magnet, uh, then that means that because the, the photons from the strand radiation kind of are collinear with the direction of the electron, uh, they will, the, that those photons will end up, um, you know, uh, in a different uh, calorimeter cluster uh, than the actual cluster from the electron, but also it will modify the momentum just before it goes through the magnet. So your measurement of the momentum will be off. So in order to do that, we do look for clusters uh, kind of aligned with the initial direction of the electrons and try to add back that energy uh, to the electrons to correct uh, the energy and the momentum. However, this procedure is not is far from being perfect, so it does help, but uh, still after the full uh, reconstruction and correction, we see uh, you know, that the resolution for the muons and the electrons is quite different. So here on the left and the right, you see what we get out of uh, you know, the first stages of the selections for when selecting a K on two muons or a K on two electrons for the invariant mass of the three particles versus Q squared in this case. Uh, and so in the left, uh, I marked them here, but essentially you can see all of the different structures that we expect. So, you know, from the resonant modes here of a B into a K on a J psi and upside to S, which are those kind of diagonal bands. And you can even make out our signal, which is B to K mu mu here as a vertical band. Um, so those structures, or at least most of them are also present in the case of the electron, but it's much harder to make up uh, from, from, and this is why. Uh, this is because of the resolution. Now, the fact that the electrons lose uh, energy through brain affects not just the resolution, uh, as I was saying, but also other stages. So the, one of the things that is greatly affected as well is the trigger. Um, so this, this actually has to do with the fact that electrons are different, not rather than electrons uh, than, than the, than, rather than to the brain in, in itself. Um, and it has to do with the way in which we identify the different kinds of particles. No? So for the muons, you can safely identify them using the muon stations, which have less occupancy, whereas for the electrons, you need to rely on the calorimeters. And those, are that, those have higher occupancy, so generally your thresholds will be uh, higher. And so in general, your trigger efficiencies for electrons will be lower. And then finally, it also impacts the reconstruction because essentially your electron tracks are much more kinky. And so they uh, will have a, a lower efficiency to be reconstructed. Uh, so in general, you are trying to look for a messier uh, if you want mass peak because the resolution is, is worse, but also with lower stats because you lose uh, a lot of electrons in the way through the, through the reconstruction. So the challenge of the analysis is essentially try to get all of these differences under control uh, and to be able to uh, you know, control the systematics so that you can make a, a precision measurement out of this uh, lepton flavor universal iteration. So to do that, we actually use a, a kind of a trick uh, 
and that we call the double ratio, which is kind of magical. So the, uh, the, the issue is that instead of trying to measure directly a ratio between muons and electrons, you do uh, a double ratio measurement where you do that, you measure that ratio normalized to a, another ratio that also involves muons and electrons, but you know very well uh, already. So in our case, we normalize to be to J psi k, where the J psi the case either to muons or to electrons, and this is measured already to be lepton flavor universal uh, at the level of 0.4%. And in that way, when you kind of look, look through the ingredients that you need, then essentially you realize that you don't need to control the efficiencies uh, absolutely between muons and electrons, but rather just relative efficiencies in different phase space regions. Uh, separately for muons and electrons. And this is actually what allows us to you know, reduce drastically our systematics and to get uh, a very good precision uh, in the end. So the yields are obtained from just the invariant mass fit that I will explain a little bit later. later and the efficiencies are computed using Monte Carlo uh, that is very carefully cal calibrated using data. And that is actually the, the part of the analysis that we spend most of our time in. So the both both of the uh, so both the what we call we will call signals of our KLL decay and the normalization channels of our J psi k uh, are selected using the same procedure, uh, and the only difference in the end is the selection in Q square. So our as I said, we are measuring RK between one and six uh, in Q square, and uh, G square in, in Q square. Uh, and the J psi is just a little bit higher, around three. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, sorry, uh, around nine. So this is uh, somehow how it looks, the, the selection in Q square. And, you know, one of the, so the, the main issue here now is somehow control what the, the ratio of efficiencies between these two regions in Q square. So even though it might look quite scary from this point of view, because you might be say, thinking, you know, well, fine, you might be controlling your efficiencies here, but maybe not, you know, maybe not in, at low Q square. Actually, what you need to care about is how uh, the two decays overlap in those variables that are somehow the, the variables that your detector care about. So, you know, those that are related directly with Q square would be things like the opening angle between the leptons uh, or the PT of, of the leptons. And actually what we can see is that given that we are, you know, because of the boost uh, of our Bs, uh, those variables indeed are not one on top of the other for the resonant and the rare mode, but, you know, the overlap is quite large. So in the end, we do achieve this cancellation of systematics that I was talking about uh, earlier. Right, so going a little bit more into uh, the, the details of it. So starting with the, uh, with the, with the selection, uh, as I said, the selection is essentially the same for resonant and rare mode, uh, with the exception of the Q square and the mass uh, um, window that we look at. The main backgrounds that uh, one would expect are, are, are those coming from, from either you know, decays that are, have much larger branching ratios that could potentially give you the same final state. So this uh, would be this type of B2C, so tree mediated uh, decays to B2C um, and C2S uh, transitions. So a B decay into a D0, for example, giving you a K on an lepton, and that those decays semi leptonic. So you, got, you get, you know, another lepton from the B decay. Um, so you end up with a K-ion and two leptons, which is your signature. Uh, but it turns out that actually these kind of backgrounds can be very uh, effectively killed uh, by just imposing some requirements on, on the kinematic, you know, on the environment mass essentially of the k and lepton to be above the mass of the D. And this is, you know, you can afford it from the signal rejection part uh, and it kills essentially all your backgrounds coming from that route. Uh, and then the second one is misidentification, uh, in particularly of pions as electrons. Um, but these also we can keep under control by imposing quite stringent electron ID um, requirements. Uh, then after that, obviously, we have our usual multivariate selection to discriminate against combinatorial background. And that means that at the end for the muons, uh, so for the K-mu uh, decays, the only remaining background comes from combinatorial background. For the electrons, due to the fact that the resolution is, is worse, then you have other things leaking into your, your window. 
uh, and this would be essentially partially the, the largest is the partially reconstructed background coming from also rare decays with an extra pion, for example, so B2K by uh, LL, where you don't reconstruct the pion. Uh, that kind of accumulate in the lower range uh, of the window. Uh, and then you also have some leakage from the JPSI itself. So when the electrons from the JPSI lose enough uh, momentum uh, through Brunstrelon, they are actually able to, to get into your, your signal window. Uh, but those can be very well controlled by actually looking at how much uh, JPSI you have uh, and looking at the efficiency ratio between them. We also have some cross checks to, you know, the, just essentially be sure that our estimates for all of the backgrounds are correct. Um, and we repeat actually the fit, varying a little bit the window, uh, obtaining equivalent results. Right, so as I said, most of the time of the analysis is spent in calibrating the efficiency. So I won't bore you, you, know, bore you with the analysis of, or with the details of all of this, but just to give you a breath of it. Uh, essentially, we need to calibrate uh, individually, essentially, yeah, almost every step of the selection. So the particle identification is uh, tuned using real data. So, um, you know, for example, for the K, and it, the particle identification requirements, the efficiency of that is calibrated using this start to be by the case. Um, the Q square and uh, mass resolutions are also uh, calibrated in data. So we use for that the personal mode uh, and we smear our Monte Carlo uh, accordingly. Uh, and things like the trigger efficiency is computed using data as well. Uh, and as well, uh, we need to calibrate our kinematics uh, for the V production. I would, I have a slide on that. But essentially, we spend most of our time making sure that our simulation describes our data and that we can trust the efficiencies that we obtain from that. So just an, uh, as a one exam one of example of one of these calibrations is the, the V kinematics. So actually. I don't know, PV is not very good at describing the kinematics of the B uh, mesons that are produced in our proton-proton collisions. And this actually has an effect on the final efficiency that you put for, for each of the decays, uh, because depending on you know, the momentum of the B or the PT of the B, then you will be more or less efficient. So this needs to be calibrated using data, and we use for that the resonance mode. So we you know, look at this signal and try to match uh, the distributions uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the simulation. And, and here is a plot that illustrates this. Uh, so here you have the, the simulation out of the box would be these uh, black points. And then you know, after the whole steps of the simulation, uh, sorry, I didn't explain what this is. This is just the, the, the number of uh, JPSI-K um, events that you observe corrected by the efficiency that you observe versus one of the variables associated with, with the V, um, in this case, the, the chi-square of the vertex. And you, know, you expect that if everything is correct, this distribution should be flat. Uh, that is not what you see with the Monte Carlo out of the box uh, depicted here in black, but after the whole step of, um, of calibrations, then you see that it's nice and flat, uh, which means that you understand your efficiency well. Right. So now, so a lot of time is spent on calibrating the efficiencies. Uh, the rest of the time is spent in making sure that those efficiencies are good. Uh, and for that, we have quite a lot of, cr of cross checks. Um, and a lot of them go around trying to make measurements of the, this quantity, RJ psi, which is a single ratio. So it is different from, from RK from, you know, from the point of view that you don't have that trick of the double ratio to cancel out systematics. Uh, but you know that number has to be one. And you know that if you measure that, then you, you have better control than you actually need on the efficiency. So it's quite a constringent uh, check. Um, so the, yeah, we measure this number and we find uh, you know, a number that is very compatible with one. We do this for different years, different trigger categories, et cetera. Uh, and we see compatible results. So this gives us confidence that uh, the integrated efficiency is, is okay. Now, as I was saying earlier, uh, obviously this tests the knowledge of the efficiencies at the JPSI, side and we are measuring RK below, you know, in a, Q, in a different Q square region. So one could think, okay, maybe you have control there, but you don't really have control down uh, in the low Q square region. Uh, and for that, we use that argument about, you know, how actually 
the JPSI mode and the signal mode overlap uh, in the quantities that actually are important for the detector. So we do we repeat this measurement of RJPSI in bins of you know many of different many different kinematic variables uh, and specifically I show you here the ones that I showed you before which are the ones that are expected to be more correlated with uh, Q square um, and again you know the value of RJPSI should be equal in all of them so you expect this distribution to be flat and compatible with one well this is renormalized so here you, what you are looking at is just the flatness of these distributions. And indeed, we look at many different variables and we observe that you know, this flatness is observed uh, everywhere. Even if we were to, so obviously you will have some statistical fluctuations, that is just life, but even if you were to take this, this kind of fluctuations that you see in these plots uh, as a genuine you know, problem with efficiency, so if you would shift your efficiency in that region by that amount and then propagate that to the measurement of RK, the impact on the measurement of RK is at the level of per mil, uh, so it is actually uh, very well covered by our systematics. Uh, finally, another, well, one thing that we do try to do uh, in order to prove a different Q square region is the measurement of the ratio R psi to S. This is much more a similar ratio than RK is because it's again a double ratio where you have a ratio between the B to Psi to SK uh, with the Psi to S going leptonically, you know, normalized to our normalization, usual normalization channel. Uh, and again, here you can see that we obtain a value that is very compatible with one. And actually this number is not as well measured as uh, the J Psi lepton flavor universalities. So this number alone already improves lepton flavor universality measurements in Psi to SDKs. Right. So now moving a little bit of a comment on the systematics. So as I said, because we have this, this ratio uh, of, of ratios, the systematic uncertainties tend to be uh, tend to cancel very well uh, in this measurement. Our dominant so sources of systematics, which are around which compose around one percent, uh, uh, come uh, from two main points. One is the choice of signal and background models in the final fit to structure K. Um, and, you know, mainly driven by the fact that our partially reconstructed background uh, is not, you know, contains uh, RK stars as well. So somehow it's a rare mode as well. So our knowledge about the distributions there need to be propagated uh, to, uh, to, the, to the shape, to the final shape that you use. And the second one is the limited obvious limitation on the statistics of calibration samples and Monte Carlo samples. And then all of the other uncertainties that come from different stages of the calibration of the efficiencies actually cancel very well. And these are you know, always at the order of one per mil. And in the end, uh, the systematic for RK uh, is at the, uh, at the order of 1.5%, which if you uh, keep in mind what we expect for the for the stats, then it means that our case is still statistically dominated. Right, so in order to you know, put everything together and, and give you the final result, obviously we need the measurement of the yields in the, resonance, in the normalization mode um, that you know, go into both our deep side, but also into the final RK. And these are obtained from fits to the JPSI constraint uh, invariant mass. Here you can see the muons on the left and the electrons on the right, and you can see that these, these peaks are really, really clean. Um, and then finally, our case is tracked from a simultaneous fit to the rare mode for electrons and muons, where you actually input as a constraint, a uh, multidimensional constraint, the ratios of efficiencies uh, and the ratio uh, of the resonant mode. So you can parameterize in the different categories that we perform the measurement, uh, all of the yields uh, as a function of RK and the yields for the muons. Um, so yeah, as I said, this constraint is placed into the fit. So you know the efficiencies are allowed to variate within their uncertainties in the final fit, and we obtain RK directly from there. So this is the this is how the final uh, it looks like well this is actually an accumulation of all of the different categories we perform the uh, the fit in uh, with all the data uh, so here you can see uh, already you know the difference that, that i was talking about at the beginning uh, so here on the left you have the mirrors which are nice and clean 
uh, nice, you know, the type pick uh, with only combinatorial background for the electrons, as I said, given the, the resolutions, whereas you have some leakage from partially reconstructed backgrounds, mainly coming from uh, B2K by AE. A little bit of leakage from the JPSI mode that, that we constrain in the feed uh, using the knowledge that we have about how much personal mode we have and the, and the ratio of efficiencies and also combinatorial. Um, right. And this is the result. So <laughs> this is the, the value that we obtained for RK, which is at the level of around 0.85 with an uncertainty of around 5% which you know decreases as expected from the extra data compared to the previous result. Um, yeah, here to have the comparison, actually the, me the measurement from Bell uh, changed a little bit since our previous publication. This, this, this number has been updated as well. Um, and you can see there that the final result that was just published, uh, I think around March as well. So now we obviously want to establish what is the compatibility with the standard model of this number. Um, and to do that, uh, what we do it uh, in, in a more Bayesian way. So we just extract our um, posterior probability for RK from the likelihood. Uh, and what we do is just integrate that PDF uh, from one onwards, uh, also taking into account the uncertainty on that one. So we take a 1% uncertainty on the theory prediction and we include that uh, into the significance calculation. So we obtain um, a p-value uh, uh, with respect under the, sorry, under the standard model prediction of uh, 10 to minus three. Uh, and when we convert it to a number of stigmas, then that gives you 3.1 standard deviations, which would then mean that we see and evidence for lepton flavor universality violation in this kind of decays. Um, another thing that comes out of this analysis is the measurement of the branching fraction for the, for the electron mode. So we can essentially put together our previous knowledge of the KMU branching fraction and RK uh, to give a measurement for this in the Q square region that we are probing. And I think it's quite interesting to put it uh, ne one next to the other, but because what we actually see is that the electrons are actually the ones that are closer to the standard model prediction. And it's again, and as we were saying at the beginning, the muons that seem to be below what the standard model predicts. So this would, this is still seems to point to, um, you know, a coupling to the muons uh, that would be kind of different from what the standard model says. Right, so I just wanted to mention really, really quickly another measurement that is really important for this uh, area uh, that was also uh, published at the same time, uh, which is the new measurement of the branching fraction of B2 mu mu. So here is a very, you know, the cheaper um, summary plots. So this is the, the actual mass fit or the mass fit in the most significant, more sensitive region. Uh, and you can see that really nice peak uh, for the BS, uh, decay uh, and a little bit of a bump here for the BD, although the significance is still not enough to so that we can measure uh, the branch infraction. Uh, and instead we put a limit. So this is the new result that was uh, just published uh, and that you know essentially leaves the compatibility with the standard model uh, more or less in the same place. So we are still compatible, uh, slightly low. But this is another measurement that is also very important for these global fits because it doesn't have any dependence on C9, so it only depends on C10, uh, and it's actually very, very clean uh, theoretically. So I just wanted to, to mention that uh, because the next thing that I want to do is put somehow these new measurements into context with in the in, in the global fits. Uh, and you know, there have been a lot of uh, theory, papers, contributions in conferences already talking about that. Uh, this, so I just stole a couple of them here. So on the left, you can see the, uh, has somehow the evolution of the plot that I was showing at the beginning, with the, sorry, beginning uh, with the new measurements. So, you know, the, I think the dash and the solid blue is essentially the effect of this update of RK um, uh, and the update for v 2 uh, in the green band. And I think uh, that you know the picture seems quite compatible. So we see that the the best fit is still separated from the standard model, which 
quite a large significance, uh, but still, you know, the, the measurements from LFU uh, and clean observables seems to be maybe not, you know, super, super compatible with uh, the measurements from the B2S mu mu observables. Uh, another thing that I think is quite interesting is the fact that you can actually resolve this, this small tangent if you include in this global fit also, you know, the possibility not just having one coupling, uh, one vector coupling or one extra coupling to the muons, but rather allowing also for, uh, for both a lepton universal and a, a lepton universal and a lepton non-universal new physics coupling. And this is what you see here uh, on the right, uh, where you can see that then, you know, all of the different observables can be nicely put together in the one sigma region uh, by allowing this uh, delta C9 universe as somehow. And, you know, as promised at the beginning, I will do a little bit of a connection with the other big anomalies, which is the measurement of RD and RD star these lepton flavor universality measurements in B2C and new transitions, so three level transitions. And this is because uh, just this nice, you know, there are a couple of nice papers uh, saying that actually this, this shift in a universal C9 uh, could actually be induced by, a, you know, by somehow a difference in the tau coupling uh, that could affect uh, these RD and RD star measurements. But because of these kind of contributions to the, you know, the lighter leptons the diagrams would give you a shift uh, that would be essentially the same for muons and electrons. So this is a quite an interesting, uh, you know, topic, uh, and it has been, you know, also put into context of a more general effective theory. Uh, where you actually have, you know, effective couplings uh, for the different diagrams uh, involved here, and you can see that you can make these anomalies kind of agree in, in that kind of scenario. And even though it's a very simplified scenario that is difficult to complete, I, I think at least uh, give us a direction in which uh, to think about these things uh, together. Right, so a couple of more slides on prospects and then I shut up. So just wanted to say that obviously we are quite cautiously excited, uh, but we are really looking forward to get all of the measurements of the plethora of other analyses that are about to come out. So already we've run two data in LHCB, we, will, we, we, we are due an update K-star, which is coming really soon. And we will be measuring lepton flavor universality test in essentially any decay that we can think of. <laughs> And these are, you know, in the pipeline and will be out quite soon. Uh, we also are doing an, uh, an update of the Angular observables. This is also, uh, you know, in the pipeline and uh, looking good. Uh, and also, obviously, because of this connection, you know, because of this, uh, because of the obvious connection with the DAOs, uh, some an area that is also growing a lot is the the trying to get uh, the case with two DAOs in the final state. Uh, and also lepton flavor violating the case involving taus. So I think that, so my view is that we probably will need run three for having a definitely a, defin a definite answer uh, to what is going on here, but certainly with, uh, um, with, the, with the data that we have at hand, uh, we will have a better picture. And obviously if this stays, uh, the, something that is mandatory is that we need to get you know, confirmation from other experiments. So, you know, our colleagues around the ring hopefully will uh, start putting some of these measurements that I'm sure they are working on uh, out. Uh, and also Bell2 is now uh, entering the game uh, and they'll be able to make some of these measurements too. Right, so this is my conclusion slide. So yeah, we are quite excited about this evidence for lepton flavor university breaking. Uh, but we have many more results that, that are about to come out that hopefully will help us understand, uh, you know, the full picture. Sorry about that. That was really long. <laughs> no, no, no. That was really good. Thank you very much, Paula. That was super interesting. Uh, so, and in fact, I, I hope that we have many questions. So please raise your hand as usual and, and go ahead. And uh, well, maybe to, to break the ice, uh, I can ask you a couple of them. They are very stupid questions eh? because I don't really know much about this topic. So while I find it very interesting, I, I feel I might ask something stupid. So can you go to slide uh, 30, for example? So 
did you say something? I don't know if, if you said something. It, it looks like the, the below uh, for the low Q and for the high Q, there is uh, a different different behavior in RK. In the uh, is this is it just a statistics or is is there any other thing that could be going on? Right. So I think I mean at this moment, given the precision of the, the, the B factor is measurements, we cannot really say much. Um, I mean, so far they are compatible with Unity, as far as we know. Yes. Um, we are trying to measure these things in LACB as well. The, uh, for us, the, the measurement at high key square is a bit more difficult because um, the background composition in that region there is different. Um, we have, so given the electron resolution is, is that bad, you actually get leakage from uh, the psi 2s. Sorry, let me, you know, if you want to measure RK up here, then you get leakage from the Psi 2S that is non-trivial. Non uh, and that complicates a little bit the final fit. But in but it is very interest, it's a very interesting point because uh, in principle, what you would expect from a you know you, um, from a new physics explanation is that you have a contribution that is flat across Q square. So that would either raise or, lo or lower the contribution to the muons. Uh, so what you would expect from you know, naively interpreting this as new physics is that RK would be the same in both cases. So you know, at low Q square, at high Q square, if this is genuine, it should be compatible. Um, so, you know, if indeed we observe a dependence with Q square, that would be an indication that there's something that we don't understand. And so that is why that is, you know, one of our main focus uh, at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. I have more questions, but I'm going to move to Begoña. Uh, okay, thank you. So, Paula, uh, thank you very much for this very nice talk. Uh, I am also not at all an expert, so I don't know the details. Uh, moving to the um, slide, I think it was close to this one, the one before, one after, where you show the peaks. Yeah, that one. Okay. Yeah, this one. So uh, could you characterize, I don't know if you are able or if you are doing, uh, what is the different, because do you know if you have extra Neon events or lack of uh, of uh, electrons, or I mean, uh, do you have yeah. an excess of one, lack or the other? And if if it is an excess, uh, could you characterize this kind of events and see something different in another in, in, in any kinematical variable or? Just, right. I, I guess you are doing this. So we, I mean, uh, I guess from the point of view of the measurement itself, uh, we are a bit agnostic to, I mean, we, we either have too many muons or too little electrons. But I think that when you put it into context with what has been measured before for the muons, it seems that it's actually the muons that are low rather than the electrons being high. So um, then the second part of the question, um, the, the issue is that we, we cannot know, you know, what, you know, what are the muons in excess somehow. We, we measure the yield for the muons that we have. Um, so it would be difficult to try to, I, I, I guess I understand what you're, what you're trying to say. So if you could somehow isolate those things that are in excess or not uh, and see if they are associated to a specific region in, uh, in Q square or in, uh, in the different variables. We do analyze. Uh, we do look at different, you know, at the at the distributions uh, of our uh, of our decays in 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 the in the different regions of phase space and in the different kinematic variables, and we don't observe um, any structure. Uh, one example. I don't know if I have here. I so we don't have the plots yet for RK because uh, I mean we we probably will include some. I don't have. Them. But for the measurement of RK star, for example, in the paper, you can see uh, the distributions of the events for muons and electrons as a function of Q square. Um, so that you can, for example, try to look for accumulations in a certain region. I don't know if all of your electrons were against the border at high Q square, maybe you would be a bit suspicious that it's uh, you know, a larger leakage maybe. Um, but I mean, this has been looked at uh, in, in previous analysis, and we've seen no no really uh, signal for for any uh, anything 
that we didn't expect. So it just seems that it's a genuine shift in the global in the global uh, amount. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, uh, of course I, I I can imagine you cannot isolate the the the. Mm -hmm. What do you don't have? I mean, why? Uh, what are the nuances that that you lack in, mm. in, in your uh, selection? But yes, so you observe no uh, significant distribution or no significant difference in in any distribution. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, Juan Pablo. Yes. Hello. Hi. Thank you very much for this, this very nice and comprehensive talk. It's it's not uh, easy to explain this in in this uh, so little time. So thank you very much for the effort. Um, um, I don't know whether um, I understood all the details because uh, it was very very fast uh, and. Uh, Sometimes I'm puzzled, and the, my first uh, impression is that I. The reason I'm puzzled is because I did not interpret correctly what I saw in the in the slide. So, if we, we go to the slide 29 again, please. So, <laughs> what I see here is uh, um, the data, and then the feed. And then on top of that, there are some combinatorial in, in orange, and then partially reconstruction in blue, and then the leakage from from in red. But I'm missing. Am I missing something? So if you add all these things, you don't get to the to to, to your background. Sorry, it's maybe just uh, my fault to use the didn't explain it very well. So here, the background contributions are stacked on top of each other. Uh, but the signal is not. So essentially, the the dashed line is the difference between the red line and the top of the background. You see what I mean? You you would need in order to get to the red from from here to here, you need to add the the dashed line on top. Mm -hmm. And the dashed line is the signal. It's the same on the left. If you see, it might be easier. So here you have the combinatorial is, is filled in this field area. And then you have the signal that is not stuck on top of the combinatorial, but rather just the signal contribution. And it's, you know, when you when you add up those two that you get to the red line. Yeah, yeah, it's OK. I, think okay. It's, I mean, the idea was to, to try to show both the, the background levels um, and the shape, the, the true shape of the signal so that it would be um, very immediate that you see the difference between the line shape of the signal in both muons and electrons. Mm -hmm. uh, did, did you play with uh, stupid things like uh, um, same sign muons to so study your background, for example? Yeah, I think Combinatorial. Have, in the muon case, it's quite uh, straightforward because, I mean, we have been looking into this case a lot. For the electrons, we do have a, a, a reference um, sample that makes it, that uses um, B2K E mu uh, combinations uh, because that would be, you will have both uh, cascade type backgrounds. So it's, things coming through semi-leptonic, uh, but also uh, combinatorial. So we use that sample to uh, cross-check uh, the shape, you know, the shape of the combinatorial and the, the effect of the different cuts uh, in the selection and all of that. So we do have some some proxies for the for the combinatorial. But not same sign, right? Or yes? No, we don't use same sign. Okay, okay, okay. Just something stupid in case. Uh, I think uh, you, same you, sign have different. I mean, you, having same sign leptons, um, it might have different um, characteristics. So, uh, you know, this. I mean, we we did uh, look into various uh, possibilities, and, uh, and the conclusion was that probably the Ke mu sample is the one that is closer to the true com composition of our combinatoria. Mm -hmm. Then regarding your reconstruction at um, 
pattern recognition and so on and so forth, uh, uh, you have no, you have the same code for electrons and muons, so they are just the track and you just treat it the same way, right? Yeah, the only thing that is different is this procedure that I was talking about uh, at the beginning, uh, in which we try to correct the Bram's trilogy that, that the electrons means. But not so at the tracking, not at the tracking, the, not the tracking level. No, yeah, from the tracking point of view, it's it's the same. Your your treatment of the electron and muon, so the the amount of energy that the the muon deposits in the silicon detector, with uh, with respect to the electron, uh, it's not. Not uh, taking it account. It's, that's uh, to to put it that no, way, exactly. right? So you will have like more more scattering for the electron tracks, uh, but they just go. I mean, there is no tracking uh, identity specific tracking. Yeah. So, anyway, your result goes in the opposite direction, right? So what you are supposed to understand better that is a mean that deposits less energy <laughs> is what is giving you less uh, less events. <laughs> right. yeah, also, I mean, I, this also would influence the the um, the single ratio, right? Because there you are, you, you also have muons versus electrons, and there you, we see that we actually get that number to be one. Yeah, going going to to that number, can, can you can you see the slide? I mean, the JSI decaying into mu mu versus uh, yes, this one. So this number is is one, okay, but it's not one point one point zero two. It's 0 0.98. So, <laughs> what does it mean? It means that uh, it means that you have more e plus e minus than mu plus mu minus. Correct? Well, yeah, but it's I mean within the dense. Hey, yes, yes. Well, but it could be 1.02, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you no, know, this 0 0.98. So it's just a stupid comment, right? But anyway, it goes in this direction. So I, I wish I would have a. Uh, is this a coincidence? That's the point, right? Maybe it is a coincidence, right? But uh, it goes in the same direction. Do you get my point? Uh, I mean, yes, but I mean, yes. how, it's, it's a coincidence. Answer. Maybe it's just a coincidence. I mean, it's, it's with many the, coincidences the, <laughs> happening. So, the I cannot, yes, yes, I cannot, yes. We can see that it's compatible. I, I yes. Know. But we, we, yes, yes, we are missing units and here yeah. somehow. It should be one and it's not any. Yes. All right, it is, I think it's 0 0.98 plus minus 0 0.02, right? So I mean, for me, this number is one. But yeah, well, yes, correct. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just playing with the, with the devil details. Or how, how is that? The devil, the, the devil is in the details or the... <laughs> Yeah, but the, 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 in this case, the devil has a systematic uncertainty and a statistical uncertainty. No? Uh, maybe, do, do you know how much is the, the subclass systematic here? Is, uh, is it more statistic? No, or? no actually, here there is dominated by the, the systematic okay. because, uh, I mean, you, we have a lot of these details, but it's because, the, like, in the rare, in the, in, sorry, in the, in the measurement of our game, uh, a lot of the systematics cancel out because of the fact that you are taking ratios between electrons and between muons. Uh, in this case, this, 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 this number is actually systematically limited. Okay. Uh, yeah. Did you have the chance to look at this variable versus uh, kinematic properties of your, uh, of your band or, or not? Yeah, this is, the, this is what is shown in this, in this slide. Uh, and these are just a couple of examples. Um, so here you have this number measured as a function of the opening angle of the two leptons. Uh, and on the right as a function of the minimum PT of the two leptons. And we repeat this uh, as a function of many different variables in the decay. Um, and we see that you know, it's compatible with one and flat uh, for all of the variables that we check. So that makes us confident that we understand that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Very nice. Okay. Maybe Juan Pablo, let's move to, since uh, we have a couple more hands raised, uh, let's move to Begonia. Yes, uh, I, I, well, the questions from Juan Pablo triggered also some, some questions. Uh, do you have a systematic uncertainty for charge uh, misassignment? Or, I mean, how well do you, do you assign the charge for a muon and for, for electrons? Because I guess uh, they, they are not equally well performing. 
So, uh, I mean, we, we study this, uh, but actually, I mean, the, the, the possibility of flipping the charge of the two leptons is quite small because already when you are in the one to six region, they are produced with a certain opening angle and then the magnet bends them in different directions. So I think the, you know, the, the chance to actually mixing, like flipping the sign uh, is, is very, very, very small. So it's something you would consider negligible. So you, you don't even assign uh, an uncertainty yeah. for that. Okay. It is completely negligible. I am still muted. Begoña, okay, if you lower your hand. So let me ask you one uh, on something different, Paula. I've been, I, I've, your slide 34. Yeah. Yeah. So this is quite interesting. Now you've said that this is what you are going to yourself be working on next, if I understood correctly. So this is, um, so let me see if I understood correctly the, the right plot. So what you were mm -hmm. saying is that by, doing the, the global fit, you, if you decouple a component that is uh, conserves uh, left and flavor and the other one that another one that violates it, violates it you can explain this in, in further models. Uh, you have, uh, can you say something more about it? I, yeah, I yeah, yeah, it's sure. quite interesting. So the idea is that, you know, so uh, these, these global fits, uh, you know, people do it, do them in very different flavors. So you can decide what, uh, new contributions you can allow, you want to allow to float in the feed, blah, blah, blah. And it was seen that if you, so the, the general picture or the kind of what we were thinking, I don't know, maybe two, three years ago is that this pointed essentially to a shift in the, in the vector coupling to the muons in this case, uh, because by modifying that, then you, you, can, you can explain all of the branching ratios for the muons being low. You can explain P5 prime, and you can explain okay. Uh, but because now somehow as the uncertainties shrink, it seems that it, there is a little bit of a tension between the branching ratios and angular measurements from in one side and then between mu, mu and RK in the other. The people have been adding, you know, adding more freedom to the global fit. Uh, and it's saying that you know, if you allow for both a new coupling to the muons, but also a new coupling that is universal, so both to the muons and to the electrons. So allowing those components uh, to be you know, to be floating in the fit, then you can actually accommodate. Well, I mean, it makes sense, no? Because it allows you to explain RK, whereas getting closer to the to the angular observables and the and the branching ratios. And now the connection there that I made with with the taus, which I guess is what you were asking about, is is the fact that you know the if you instead of uh, looking into the kind of wet theory, so like the, the weak effective theory, but you go a little bit higher uh, and you interpret it in, as a function of a SMEFT uh, uh, Wilson coefficients, then you can see that you can induce uh, effects uh, that are universal for the muons and electrons by adding an extra coupling to the, you know, a, a, an extra coupling to the taus, because you will have these kind of contributions here when you where you have uh, you know a, a local operator that gives you b to tau tau then you close the loop and then you produce your lighter leptons from from the photon that emerges so this contribution gives you something that is the same for muons and electrons so this gives you your c9 universal and then on top you have something that also violates universal you know that also violates universality between the lighter leptons so it's a, it's a way, so if you do have something, you know, some coupling to the DAOs, um, then it immediately makes you think about the other uh, um, anomalies uh, in which you have, uh, you are comparing uh, B2C tau mu with B2C mu nu. Uh, so, you know, having a larger coupling to the DAOs there could help you explain RD and RD star. Uh, and for I mean, one example is having uh, the U, the vector leptoquark uh, that would uh, couple uh, a tree level to the, you know, to give you the anomalies in RD and RD star, which are actually larger. And then you would have a loop contribution uh, giving you RK and RD star and so on. Uh, and you know, so that is kind of the reasoning behind the connection. But I mean, I think it's 
it's fair to say that this is a very simplified scenario that I don't think anyone can come up with a model in which you can modify just these Wilson coefficients, not touching anything else. So, you know, there are people working in kind of realizations of this particular con configuration, but I think all of them would give you hints in, in other processes. But in general, I think that, you know, the fact that you have something that couples differentially to the different lepton families immediately makes you think about the Taos. Uh, because those are the ones that are less, the least explored because they are, they are at least for us the most difficult. Uh, so there's a lot of activity trying to get B2S tau tau or B2S tau mu uh, kind of decays. Right, that sounds really interesting. And uh, as you were mentioning in the next slide, yes, it would be interesting to see what uh, what we can do in CMS about all of this. Uh, well, I mean, I've heard that the CMS is uh, at least for the RDR the star. Uh, they will, they have good prospects. So we are kind of keen to see. Uh, well, I think going. you have to, it's not going to come fast, eh? but as far as I know. Well, yeah, this always happens. Are very interesting <laughs> in, in all of this. But yeah, it will be interesting indeed. Okay, and a, a completely stupid comment, uh, question, uh, that again, it's because I, I like the topic, but I don't know much about it. So and what about the tau, tau rare decays? It's that something that you could also like, uh, all the tau to mi gamma or tau to three mu, etc. Results uh, do they also enter here, put in constraints or or uh, also the mu, the the mu on the uh, case mm. as well. So um, they can be connected, but I don't think they can be connected in a model independent way. Okay. Um, so things like uh, yeah, for example, g minus two is something that you could. Could, you know, there are specific models in which you could link these anomalies, you know, RK, uh, the angular, blah, 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 you know, these kind of anomalies with G minus two, but it has to go through, you know, you need a specific set of assumptions okay. because in, you know, uh, fully generically, like with this kind of fits, um, they are not uh, naturally connected. Okay, so this is very interesting and I could keep on asking, but I think uh, we are getting close to the to, to lunch time. So I am going to ask if there are more questions to pa Paula. Uh, it seems uh, not, I think it's also because uh, we ask a lot, so we are getting <laughs> close to, to the time that people are hungry. But thank you so much. It's been really interesting. And uh, yeah, uh, we are really looking forward to what happens in run three and what happens when we complete the picture with this. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for connecting as well. Eh? So uh, see you uh, in a couple of weeks for, for another seminar. Bye, Paula. Bye bye. Thanks a lot.